In the last video, we spoke quite in depth about Oda Nobunaga, the first unifier of Japan. But as we learned, Oda Nobunaga would be betrayed by his own retainer, Akechi Mitsuhide, who had murdered the famed warlord and his son in 1582. Akechi Mitsuhide would then declare himself as Shogun and would seek to continue the path in which Nobunaga was on by unifying the other clans under himself. But unfortunately for him, he was no Nobunaga, and the other clans merely scoffed at his attempt. Many of the other daimyo would cut ties with him, and those who showed him support did so half-heartedly. Mitsuhide counted on the fact that he would maintain his shogun status, because Toyotomi Hideyoshi was off fighting the powerful Mino clan, and therefore wouldn't have had the time nor the capacity to march back and avenge his master. But this is where Mitsuhide made his first mistake, for Hideyoshi would make peace with the Mino clan. With the Mino clan at his side, he would march alongside Nobunaga's other retainer, Tokugawa Ieyasu, against Mitsuhide with the intention of taking Nobunaga's place. Mitsuhide's rule as shogun would only last 13 days before he was crushed by the combined might of Hideyoshi and Ieyasu during the Battle of Yamazaki. In fact, to his disgrace, Mitsuhide would go on to be known as the 13-day shogun. His short time as shogun would even spawn the Japanese idiom Mikatenka, meaning short-lived. Mitsuhide would eventually flee the Battle of Yamazaki, but he would be murdered soon after by a bandit leader known as Nakamura Chobei, who would thrust a spear through him as they crossed paths for seemingly no reason at all. Essentially, it would be during this month of 1582 where we see Akechi Mitsuhide go from zero to hero and then back to zero again. But let's get back to Toyotomi Hideyoshi and discuss his life and service to Nobunaga before we go about revealing his fate. Very little is known about Toyotomi Hideyoshi's early life. In fact, he only begins to appear in surviving historical documents around the year 1570. An autobiography was written for him in 1577, but you'd find little about his early life in the writings. Hideyoshi was known not to speak about his life before meeting Nobunaga, for reasons unknown. Maybe because it's said that he came from a peasant background, and one that he was ashamed of. There are some tales that he was born and raised in the Wari province, the home of the Oda clan, but there is no traces of his family in history, nor are there any links to any samurai lineage. In these tales, he was born to a peasant soldier named Yewon, who would raise him and Hideyoshi's supposed sister, but apparently Yewon died when Hideyoshi was only 7 years old. The fate of his sister remains unknown, but legends have it that Hideyoshi would be sent to a temple to study. But he would flee from the temple, because studying didn't suit him, and he went on to join the Imagawa clan, but would then desert them when he came across a large sum of money. It's just as well that he deserted the Imagawa clan, because in 1558, he would join Oda Nobunaga's clan and fought against them in the Battle of Okihazama. As I mentioned in my video about Oda Nobunaga, Imagawa Yoshimoto was a fierce man with 20,000 men at his disposal. But when they were drinking and off guard, Nobunaga struck with just 3,000 men, including Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and would somehow win. It's suggested that Hideyoshi talked his way into Nobunaga's presence, and his later feats prove that Hideyoshi was indeed quite the smooth talker. By gaining Nobunaga's ear, he would go on to become his personal sandal bearer. While that doesn't sound like the most glamorous of jobs, it was considered a high-ranking title in feudal Japan, whereby the sandal bearer was to be revered. As I mentioned, Toyotomi Hideyoshi was a smooth talker. We see evidence of this in 1564, during the siege of Inabayama Castle, a siege that lasted two weeks on the orders of Oda Nobunaga when warring for the Mino province against the Saito clan. Hideyoshi was able to convince a number of the Mino warlords to yield and leave the Saito clan. He even managed to get the much respected Saito clan strategist, Tekanaka Shigaharu, to switch sides. This made taking Inabayama Castle a simple victory for Nobunaga, who took note of Hideyoshi's masterful negotiation tactics. It would be in 1573, after several victorious campaigns including the Battle of Anagawa and the Siege of Nagashima, did Nobunaga appoint Hideyoshi as daimyo of three districts in the Omi province. To be a daimyo would be huge, especially for one who grew up as a peasant, for it now gave Hideyoshi political powers in which he would never have obtained given his low status. Hideyoshi would go on to fight many battles under Nobunaga's orders, and would find victory after victory that would see him grow as a legendary warlord. After the assassination of Oda Nobunaga, 
and after Hideyoshi had dealt with Mitsuhide's short-lived shogun term, the succession of Nobunaga was up for debate. It seemed like Oda Nobutaka, the third son of Oda Nobunaga, would take up the mantle, but Hideyoshi slighted both him and the Oda clan's chief general, Shibata Hikitsui, by throwing his support behind Oda Hodenobu, the grandson of Oda Nobunaga and the son of Oda Nobutada, who was killed alongside his father by Mitsuhide. Hideyoshi was successful in helping Hidenobu retain the mantle of Nobunaga, as well as raising his own influence with the Oda clan. Tensions would grow, however, between himself and Katsui, and pretty soon, the two men would fight at the Battle of Shizugatake a year later. Hideyoshi would destroy Katsui's forces, whereby his strongest warriors would become known as the Seven Spears of Shizugatake. Hideyoshi would become so powerful at this point, that 30 of the Japanese provinces were under his thumb. Oda Nobukatsu, yet another son of Nobunaga, remained hostile to Hideyoshi's takeover however. He allied himself with Tokugawa Ieyasu, and the two sides fought against Hideyoshi at the Battle of Kamaki and Nagakut. It ultimately ended in a stalemate, although Hideyoshi suffered heavy losses due to the combined efforts of Nobukatsu and Ieyasu. Hideyoshi would make peace with Nobukatsu soon after, ending the war between the clans, whereby Ieyasu would actually agree to become a vassal of Hideyoshi after having received Hideyoshi's sister and mother as hostages. Much like Nobunaga though, Hideyoshi never achieved the title of Shogun, but he would attain the much respected title of Imperial Regent in 1585, having served the Fujiwara clan. He would build an expensive palace two years later, having now amassed riches, honour and fame. Hideyoshi carried on where Oda Nobunaga had left off, by conquering Shikoku, and taking control of other areas that Nobunaga didn't get around to, including the Echigo province and Kyoshu. He even began to implement new laws that set him apart from Nobunaga, including the banning of weapons to anyone other than samurai. Those who had swords would be hunted down and have their weapons confiscated. The confiscated weapons would be melted down and created into a large statue of Buddha. The sword hunt effectively prevented peasants and other rebel groups from revolting. In 1590, Hideyoshi would face off against the Hojo clan in the Kanto region, who were the last clan who resisted against Hideyoshi's authority. It would bring about what was known as the Siege of Odawara. What amuses me about the Siege of Odawara is that as Hideyoshi's intentions became clear, the Hojo clan began setting up major defences around their castle. But Hideyoshi would bring such a large number of men to siege the castle, that they would have to sleep on the ramparts. In fact, it would be known as the most unconventional siege in Japanese history, for the samurai would be entertained by prostitutes, musicians, acrobats, fire eaters and jugglers right there on the would-be battlefield. The Hojo clan refused to engage with such a massive force, and so remained behind their castle walls, starving might I add. The Hojo clan would eventually surrender, and it is this victory for Hideyoshi that would mark the end of the Sengoku era. After the siege, Hideyoshi would offer his ally, Tokugawa Ieyasu, the eight provinces once ruled by the Hojo clan in the Kanto region. The only catch was that Ieyasu would have to surrender his own five provinces, thus granting more power to Hideyoshi, which given the size of Hideyoshi's army, Ieyasu could hardly say no. In the end though, this would work out to be a pretty sweet deal for Ieyasu, who in the Kanto region would be far enough out of Hideyoshi's reach that he himself had main jurisdiction over the lands in which he governed. The Toyotomi dynasty would be thrown into doubt though, for Hideyoshi's only child, his three-year-old son, Surumatsu, would suddenly die. Hideyoshi would have no choice but to name his nephew, Hidesugu, as his heir, going on to adopt him a year later. Hideyoshi would soon retire a year after, and his nephew would pick up the mantle. But it's around here that we begin to see the decline of Hideyoshi's health. But even so, he was still seeking glory, for despite his achievements, he was still not satisfied with his legacy. He wanted more. Oda Nobunaga once spoke about his dream of conquering China, and so Hideyoshi adopted this mission, seeking to take over China by way of Korea. But the Korean government didn't quite like the idea of Japanese troops marching through their territory. They were concerned that Chinese soldiers would march right towards them and then battles would take place on Korean soil, putting their own country at risk. Hideyoshi heard their concerns and was pretty empathetic, understanding that he couldn't march his own troops through Korea without the government's permission. So instead, 
he put in preparations to invade Korea and use it as he pleased anyway. The area of Seoul in Korea fell easily enough in 1592 under the might of Hideyoshi's forces. The entire country would be divided up into eight sections, where a prominent route into China was established. Seonjo of Joseon, the king of Korea, escaped the land and requested military interventions from the Chinese to help him take his country back. The Chinese would send 43,000 soldiers under the orders of the Chinese emperor to recapture Korea. The Japanese would see some success when defending Korean territory, going on to defeat Chinese forces in the suburbs. But elsewhere, their entire navy was destroyed by Admiral Yi Sun-sin of Korea. With their navy destroyed, Hideyoshi could not resupply his troops in Korea, and thus, his dream of conquering China quickly melted before his eyes. Some would say that this huge failure to take China would change Hideyoshi, making him a bitter, angry and vindictive man. It's at this moment in his life that I feel he is most comparable to his master, Oda Nobunaga, for Hideyoshi would go on to demonstrate a wicked streak in the same way Nobunaga did when killing children and helpless monks, and even members of his own family for that matter. You see, one of Hideyoshi's concubines would birth him another son a year later after the failed conquest of China in 1593. But as I mentioned earlier, Hideyoshi had already given succession over to his nephew, Hidesugu, Rumours began to circulate Hidesugu quite prominently around this time that he was something of a serial killer, unjustly killing people simply because he felt like it. But historians believe that these were all made up, likely by Hideyoshi loyalists, to weaken his hold of succession. But Hideyoshi would finally come to accuse Hidesugu of treason and plotting a coup against him and thus ordered him to commit suicide. You'd think that was enough for Hideyoshi. His nephew was now out of the picture and his son would now grow up to take his place. But not quite. This is where we see Nobunaga's brutal influence, for any daimyo associated with Hidesugu was rounded up and then destroyed. But Hideyoshi didn't even stop there. He ordered the execution of the entirety of Hidesugu's family, including children, wives and mistresses. The harshness of such an order would shock Japanese society and would have many daimyo sever ties with him. In fact, the whole incident is said to be one of the key causes to the Toyotomi downfall. One case that stands out the most is Hideyoshi's refusal to spare the life of Mogami Yoshiaki's 15-year-old daughter, who had only just arrived in Kyoto to become Hidesugu's concubine. She hadn't even met Hidesugu, and probably wasn't even that keen on marrying him in the first place, but Hideyoshi had her killed anyway. Her death caused the Mogami clan, who were a pretty powerful clan might I add, to turn against Hideyoshi and zealously support the Tokugawa clan in the Battle of Sekigahara against Toyotomi loyalists five years later. Only one of Hidesugu's children was spared, a one-month-old girl named Kikuhime who was adopted by a distant family member. Maybe Hideyoshi had a heart after all, albeit a tiny one. But Hideyoshi's bloody nature would only continue to worsen, perhaps to go above and beyond the murderous personality of Oda Nobunaga. You see, at least Nobunaga was tolerant of different races and religions, and liked to learn about other cultures, despite being patriotic. Hideyoshi, on the other hand, saw no benefit in these notions. He had 26 Christians killed in February 1597, who would become known as the 26 Martyrs of Japan. Three young boys were amongst those who were killed by public execution. More murders were committed throughout the years, until the church was officially outlawed. As I mentioned in my last video about Nobunaga, Nobunaga supported the building of churches in Japan and didn't mind people practicing their own faiths. It just goes to show how somewhere along the lines, despite being heavily influenced by Nobunaga, Hideyoshi would ultimately differ from his master as he descended down a cruel and bloody path. Hideyoshi wouldn't learn his lesson either. He would go back to Korea for a second shot at invasion, but their efforts here were even more fruitless than the last one. In June 1598, they were able to defeat several Chinese offensives in Korea, but were unable to make much more progress beyond that. The Ming army would prepare for a final assault and would harass the Japanese forces by using guerrilla warfare tactics. But pretty soon, all three forces of Japan, Korea and China were exhausted. 1598 would see Hideyoshi die in Fushimi Castle at the age of 61. His death would be kept secret by the Council of Five Elders, five daimyo members who had been brought together by Hideyoshi to rule Japan until his infant son was old enough to rule himself. 
Amongst these five elders was Tokugawa Ieyasu, who would hold majority of the power amongst them. It was deemed wise to keep Hideyoshi's death a secret, so as to not deplete the already thinning morale of soldiers in Korea. Hideyoshi's forces were unable to take China. In fact, they barely had a grasp on Korea by the time of his death. Tokugawa Ieyasu would decide to prohibit any further military expeditions into Korea or China, and close Japan to all foreigners. Ieyasu would go on to acquire the support of other daimyos in the wake of Hideyoshi's death, going on to gain more support than the infant boy Hideyoshi had left behind. Pretty soon, the Toyotomi name lost its power, and the only name anyone was holding up was Tokugawa. Loyalist forces to Toyotomi would fight against Tokugawa, but they were ultimately crushed at the Battle of Sekigahara in the year 1600, where Tokugawa Ieyasu would be named Shogun. Despite his cruel and harsh ways, particularly towards the end of his life, Hideyoshi was able to change Japanese society in a great number of ways. As I mentioned earlier, Hideyoshi banned peasants and farmers from holding weapons, but he also required all samurai to leave their land and take up residence in castle towns. This would solidify the social class system for the next 300 years. He also required all Japanese to stay in their respective lands unless given official permission to go elsewhere. This would ensure order in a period where bandits still roamed the countryside and peace was still an alien thing as the Sengoku period came to an end. He was also noted to ban slavery in 1590. Hideyoshi was also pretty big on tea ceremonies in Japan, spending large amounts of money on the finest ceramics and sponsoring expensive social events. The tea ceremony would even become implemented into the ruling class and become something of a tradition as a result of Hideyoshi's enjoyment of them. It's here that we get a glimpse of the light-hearted side of Hideyoshi, who during ceremonies would memorize the lines from plays and performances. He would then force his reluctant daimyos to join him in performing them on stage. Tokugawa Ieyasu would leave the majority of Hideyoshi's decrees in place and built his shogunate upon them. This ensured that Hideyoshi's cultural legacy remained. Another amusing anecdote from Toyotomi Hideyoshi's life is the nickname Kozaru that he'd been given by Oda Nobunaga because of his facial features and skinny frame that resembled that of a monkey. Sometimes, Oda Nobunaga would refer to him as the bald rat. So Toyotomi Hideyoshi certainly had a roller coaster of a life, much like his master before him. But what were your favorite parts from Hideyoshi's life? Do you think that his invasion of China would have brought him the feeling of self-fulfillment that he seemed to so desperately crave? Or was he in way over his head? What do you guys think about his brutal nature when it comes to his nephew's family, where he went on to murder them all simply by association? Do you think he was driven to some form of insanity? Or did Nobunaga's influence over him drive him to such extremities? Let me know in the comments below what you thought about Hideyoshi's life, and don't forget to like this video and hit the subscribe button. We'll be wrapping up our Unifiers of Japan with Tokugawa Ieyasu in the next video, before we start to cover more individual samurai and those who identified as ninjas. Until the next time guys.